and we're going to post the video and the uh, on on YouTube, and then we will have the um, the PowerPoint mailed out to everybody um, shortly after we're done with the uh, presentation. Uh, so we're going to get started. Where we are today, um, we are. We're well, doing a series of webinars on different aspects of CSD Cares. I realized the last one was quite long, but in fact, I am not planning on this actually lasting until 4 p.m. Um, the idea being we're going to take smaller units of um, groups of activities and content areas in CSD Cares and, and just get the uh, fairly brief trainings out there and then post them publicly. And the idea is you'll be able to come back and refer to this later. Um, and in this case, we'll probably do a follow up at some point. Um, as you'll notice at the end of the presentation, um, reporting functions are still a work in progress and we definitely want more and are working with developers on creating some more uh, reporting capacity and when we have that we'll come back and bring that uh, bring that to you as well uh, but people have actually been asking me uh, for weeks now to do something about health events to do uh, some kind of creating a presentation on on where and how to enter health events so that is the focus of uh, today's training uh, <clears throat> just kind of get everybody on the same page about how that works because it does work a little bit differently than other systems that we used to use or might be used to um, working with. Okay. So first of all, just a, re a review again of what we've covered so far. CSD Cares is our new information system. Um, you have access to it through a single sign-on system, um, which is what we call your DFSS dashboard. So this is where you get there if you're not on there very often. It's HTTPS double slash Chicago dash DFSS.org. If you don't have the right access, you were given a road to access document at, uh, at the past couple directors meetings now. Uh, there are different snapshots. Again, we'll probably send that out again when we send out the, um, the PowerPoint presentation. Um, and so this will take you a link to where you can start a ticket, basically, even if you don't have access or to the SurveyMonkey form to add new users. I want to point out at every opportunity, I was responsible for a lot of that in COPA, but I am not here. So if you send me direct information about um, uh, people needing different access or additional access or adding new users. There's not a lot that I can do about it because I don't have control of that anymore. So all I can do in those cases is direct you to start a ticket. So start a ticket. They don't actually all come to me. <laughs> so with that preface, our expectations for this year, everybody is going to be enrolled. We're going to get their data and new children can only be added through school mint. We're not going to be able to turn around and get you IDs for children who come in by other means anymore. That was a one time option. Uh, now everyone knew has to come through school. Minute. We're going to be continuing to roll out and refine capacities. We need you to attend training you're doing right now. Thank you. Review materials in the knowledge base, attempt to implement new modules. Um, and ask for help rather than getting up if it's not working correctly. So having said all that, before I go on, I just want to demonstrate. I know every time I've come on this year, I've mentioned the knowledge base, but I figure we'll just take a moment, take a look at it. So this is my dashboard. It probably looks a lot like yours. Uh, it may have a few more tiles on it. So on your dashboard, though, you should have a service now link it's it just says now on it that's what we're talking about so when you go in here there's two important links to look at here first is get help this is when i say start a ticket this is where you start a ticket and the the other link says knowledge this is what we're referring to as a knowledge base it is replacing what we used to have 
the first year or so of CSD Cares, which we call the digital hub. Um, and we brought that out separately because ServiceNow wasn't online yet, although this was always a plan. So if you scroll down on the screen, you see there are multiple knowledge bases. So I'm going to pick one, which is CSD Cares for delegate agencies. And it reloads the page. Also, if you're looking for something specific on here, when you get to the knowledge base, you can literally come in here and just say immunization or whatever and hit search and it'll bring you everything in that area that they have in terms of materials. But if you look down here, you'll see there are a lot of options for what we're um, lots of training materials in here, videos, um, self-guided courses and so on. Almost everything that I'm going to talk about today, you can find in here. Uh, it's not where you think it would be. You would say, where is health? They didn't really break out the trainings like this. It, it's going to be part of the family support case management section. So there are a lot of videos, how-to documents, and a big, long, self-paced course in this one. So I'm looking at documents. You can see grant referrals, screenings and assessments, health events, caseloads, um, you know. So this is where you can find most of the information that you need. Uh, so it's the first place you should go and look. And then if you can't find what you need, you're in the same app that you can use to start a ticket. So that's convenient. So what we're going to do today, um, here we're going to talk about why we're collecting health information, what kinds of information that we're collecting, and we'll go through some of the specific um, subcategories here because they're not all exactly found in the same place. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about documentation going forward. Okay, so first of all, <laughs> Um, a, a lot of the interest that we have in collecting health records has to do with our federal funding. So for those children who receive any kind of Head Start or Early Head Start funding, um, one of the regulations is right here, it's 1302.42B. And it says that um, within 90 days of the child first attending, we need to make a determination of whether the child is up to date on the EPFDT. So those of you who are paying attention to the FA2 review and the outcome last time will recall that this is where the feds were unhappy with our current system. So we are trying to uh, tighten up and improve this and have better documentation that we are in fact doing this. And I will point out one of the reasons this is a requirement is the subpart two down there, which is if the child is not up to date, uh, agencies are expected to work with the families to get the children up to date um, as quickly as possible. So, uh, the next question, of course, is that's all just a lot of letters. What is the EPSDT? So that stands for Early and Periodic Screening, Diagnosis, and Treatment. And it is a schedule of mandated uh, comprehensive and preventative health programs for young people. So it, the, I, the term was coined as part of a law in 1989. And initially, it's focused on Medicaid, but then, of course, anything that has a federal funding stream, which is basically everything to some extent, um, are required to um, adhere to this schedule. Now, the thing is, although it comes from the federal government, the concept comes from the federal government, they did not actually produce a schedule of what has to happen. Like many things in our federalist system, they left this up to the states. So each state has the ability to come up with their own um, EPSDT schedule, which is kind of weird because I don't think your health needs actually change just because you moved from Indiana to Illinois. Um, but Illinois and a number of other states then also didn't come up with their own schedule. They 
deferred to one that had been developed by the American Academy of Pediatrics. So this schedule is sometimes called the Bright Future Schedule, but that term in Illinois anyway is in interchangeable with the EPSDT. Uh, so whichever term people are using, they're talking about the same thing. And this is a screenshot of part of it that should look familiar. If people are not familiar with this, let me know in the chat before the end of the presentation, and we can send this out as well, because I have a version of this document uh, PDF already. But hopefully everyone is familiar with this, because it's talking about what kinds of screenings have to be done at what age. Um, and that you can see that continues through uh, four-year-olds. So it's every, actually, there is a, I cropped the screenshot there, um, the requirements for, for kindergarten and onward as well. It's just, it doesn't really apply to us. But uh, here's the birth to five schedule. Um, and one thing you'll notice about this is that um, the language is kind of strange. <laughs> not the way we normally talk about it. Uh, and that language was copied directly in the CSD CARES. So when the, when the health events module was created, the people creating it were looking at that schedule. And so that's why you have these strange names. Um, and we'll get to that in a minute, I think. But like developmental surveillance, um, you know, I've got some, some of the other ones. They're, they're terms that come directly off of the EPSTT. Actually, that, that particular bright futures form that we're looking at. So, because we already know what the schedule that we're looking for based on state policy, when a child is enrolled in CSD CARES, the system will automatically create what are called health events. And at the time, they'll be blank. There'll be due dates associated with them, but no other information. So what you're seeing right now is an example um, from an actual CSD CARES record. Based on the, the child's age and enrollment date, it's looking at what, um, what screenings and health activities should have happened already, and it's already created them. So um, here we call them health events. Uh, enrollee. So here we go. This is what I'm talking about. The language are used for the labels may seem odd because it's not what we've usually used. Um, and I've heard people be confused by that, but it's drawn directly from the bright future schedule so they can basically look it up. Uh, one of the weird ones that people have asked about is that at every age level, there's something in there that's called anticipatory guidance. And People are saying, I've never done that before. I don't know what that is. That is comes from the, the expectation that agencies would have discussion and counseling as part of each visit. And we're discussing like the need for oral hygiene, brushing your teeth, diet and nutrition, uh, injury prevention, developmental progress, and so on. So yeah, anyway. People had asked, so that's what we're looking for. Um, <clears throat> so the other thing is the records created will go back to birth. Um, if you are enrolling an older child who's not an infant, you don't necessarily need to go back in there and fill in every possible event since birth. You just need to enter the last year or so, the most recent of everything to see if that makes them up to date um, with their current status. So <laughs> when you call up those health events, uh, I thought I had a slide in here and I'm not seeing it about the basic language that we're talking about. So let me do that and if it comes up here and was out of order. I'll, I'll just skip over it. And before I send it out, I'll put it in the right order. But just some basic language here um, about CSD CARES. So people in CSD CARES they, they have files, and whether you're talking about a child or the parents or um, staff, teachers, those are all have records that are called contacts. So when I talk about the child contact record, that's what I'm talking about. There's a 
um, they have a contact file, with, which is a little bit different than COPA when people were used to working in COPA, because instead of the child contact, the child record being tied to the parent, both the child and the parent are individual contact records, and they're in something that's called uh, an account. So a family is an account, a household is against called a household. Um, and so is a center or an agency. Those are also accounts. So the account is like a, a think of it as, as a building. So some things that we're going to do, most things that we're going to do today are part of the child contact record. But at one point, I'll start talking about the, the household account record. Uh, and that it, that's kind of a different structure. Now, within a con every kind of record, actually, within the but within the contact record for children, um, there are a lot of boxes that have a colored label that go go down the right side of the screen, and those are called related lists or related boxes. So again, when I mention a related list, that's what I'm talking about. I'm saying somewhere on the child's contact page, there's a box with this with this label. So <clears throat> coming back to the present, when you need to add health events, and these are these are going to be individual screenings for the most part that are on the child's physical or or on some other piece of documentation. So you go to the related list. Um, and it will still show you the first few in the box on the child's uh, screen on the on the contact record. But in all of these boxes, there's a little button that says view all. And when you click on that, you'll get the entire list. Um, so here's an example. I'm looking at the um, lead screening. And it's lead number five. These are number because it's got to do with the age of the child. So. You, you, it's just one is for 24 months. Um, so if you're dealing with a two-year-old, this is the one that will need to be filled in to make them up to date. So you look at the details here. This is the same for all of the different kinds of health events. Um, any pencil, if you click on the pencil, it'll open up all of the fields. Okay. So this is what it looks like opened up, and here I'm filling out um, different elements. Uh, so a couple of things. Again, the due date was here. You're going to put the actual completion date in, and then it wants to know who completed it by and where. Um, just a note, they tell me this error has been fixed, but sometimes it still pops up. Um, so if the completed by, uh, if you put other, you you need to populate that completed by other field. If that's blank, um, then when you try to re-enroll the child, you get an error message. I'm not sure what the what the connection between those two things are, but you can get um, you can escape from that and not have to face that if you just put anything in the completed by other field. So you fill out the forms in here, the, the different fields in here and submit. So the next thing is in COPA, if you're used to working with COPA, when you put the screening and you would also put the result. But in this case, this initially the health events were just put in here to see if the if the items on the EPSDT list had been had occurred, and so it's um it's like a checklist, and and if you complete them all, then it will consider you to be up to date. But it, it doesn't have results in there, which means that if a child has a condition needing treatment, we haven't identified it yet. So there is another related list on the child's contact record is called health conditions. So that means if you do the, if you mark that they had a lead screening and the lead level is fine, you don't need to do anything else. Um, if it's elevated, then you need to go and add a health condition uh, that will indicate 
that treatment was indicated. So you go to the health condition list, which looks like this, and you hit new. <laughs> so and the list of conditions on here, because that was where we developed this from, are the list on um, on the PIR. I believe you could pick other and put something else in if it's relevant. Um, but most things are covered on the drop down. So you would pick um, the area from the list and put it in there. It's then going to go on and ask you if they'd received treatment for it. It's assuming that it's a condition that potentially needs treatment. So if it doesn't, you don't really need to put in a health condition record. So if you're putting in it, it assumes there is one. So there's one of two things that you can do. You can indicate um, that they are receiving treatment and put the last treatment date in the field, or um, you can enter the primary reason the child did not receive treatment. And again, if that's other, a comment in the other field is required. Um, but it's one or the other. Either they received treatment or there is some reason they did not receive treatment. So you have to fill out one of those, but if you fill out both of those, you're going to get an error message. Because if they received treatment, then there shouldn't be a reason that they didn't receive treatment. Um, and if it's something that's not like a controlled chronic condition, um, you could just put um, as a reason for not receiving treatment, no treatment needed is an option. If you filled out the PIR spreadsheet, you see that these are all, all of this is organized the same way that the spreadsheet is. And eventually we're going to replace the spreadsheet with a report from here. Okay, so those are health conditions. It's pretty simple. And so it, it's the, the second part of the event, basically. It's the second part of the screening. If, if, um, if, if they had a health condition, asthma, you know, anemia, what have you put it in, put it in here and then we'll be able to produce a report on that later. Okay. So here's the one that operates differently. Um, so insurance, because it's likely, but not always the case that the entire family will be on the same insurance policy rather than asking if the separately if the parent has insurance or the child does the, uh, the whole thing is just done from the household level so you're, you're not looking at the individual child you're looking at the account the uh, accounts in here usually have there it's a strange way of phrasing but it, it, it's pretty regular so you get used to it it's like last name um, then in parentheses the child's name and and then mom's name um, so that it's kind of a weird label, but that's the household account. It's the same place where um, the income record lives, the address record lives, and so on in that account page. Uh, so on this page, up in the upper right hand corner, um, everyone's view is a little bit differently, but for most people's view, you see create family goal as the far right option. But if you click on that little triangle, uh, you can open up the rest of the menu because there's quite a large menu here and you can scroll down to add insurance. And click on that and there is an automatic workflow that you will start that will walk you through adding insurance. Right, so it looks like this, the first page. You need to, um, I, I guess the, there's two fields on here so that it forces you to stop and read it and make sure that you're putting the correct thing in. Um, but when you look at the insurance, the first thing you fill in is the insurer. Um, that would be like Blue Cross Blue Shield, Medicaid, all kids, whatever. It's either a government program or it's uh, the private insurance company. And based on what you enter into there, it's going to restrict the menu on the insurance type, which is the next one. So normally there's only going to be one field. And the only reason that's even useful is that you would say, no, that's not the right type. And that means you've got the first answer wrong. 
Um, also, you notice you're going to have to check a value up above. I didn't hear when I was taking the screenshot, but you can any and all of medical, dental, and vision for the type. There's a place to put the policy and group number in here. But since most of us are not billing insurance for anything, we may not have that information. Um, and so far as I know, it's not required. But here you see, since I picked all kids for the top menu, if I looked at the pull down menu there, private insurance isn't there. Um, all I have is Medicaid. And then um, if I was all kids without families or just covering the child, the only option down there would be would be CHIP. So they are a little bit different. The difference here is whether mom is covered, basically. Uh, so when you fill that out and go on to the next page, um, then it asks which members of the household are on the insurance plan. So again, if not everybody is covered, you just don't check them. But if they are all covered, you just check all of the boxes. It's where you only add insurance once, and it applies to everyone in the household. And then you'll hit finish. Okay. So the next section, similar to other health records, immunizations again are their own related list on the child contact record. So you find the the immunization line there, and if it, if there's nothing in there right now, that's just a bar, and there's nothing under it. In this case, I'm looking at a, a child record that's got uh, several immunizations already in here. So just go ahead and click on new. Um, and then it will let you add an immunization. Now, rather than have one sheet, every type of immunization is its own record here, but not every shot. So you can add the entire series as a single immunization. So this looks messy here. It looked cooler, I thought, when I was putting it together than I think it does now. But this is the overall immunization screen, so you can put the type in here. The trade name will populate. Um, it should. You've got the, the compliance status and so on. But if you notice that you put those one details, particularly for younger children who are having a series, um, and so you can put those one in and the due date, and then save it. And you can come back and open the same record and add the second dose uh, after the first one. Now, you'll notice there is not a pencil icon next to the dose one or dose two possible, dose three possible box here. That's calculated by the particular immunization. So the system knows what the shot sequence is and how many uh, immunizations on a regular schedule or a delayed schedule, and it's already going to populate this. So. Once you enter dose one, dose two possible, if it's something that is needed, will be checked. Um, so this record is a little messy now that I look at it. But yeah, um, and so then when you close it, it'll calculate the next due date. And when it's complete, the system should know that. Okay. So you notice once you've entered the type of immunization, there's information also that's populated in the upper right-hand corner. It says what the series is, um, I you know what the um, what the frequency is, how many are are recommended, and so on. Okay. So going back to the beginning, we we. Um, started this by talking about the need to make a determination about whether the child is up to date or not. And that has to be done early in the enrollment period. Again, because if the child is not up to date, then it's expected that program staff will help make referrals, uh, find resources and so on to assist the family in getting up to date. So. The way that we document that status is to complete the health history. So, and I can't stress this enough. At the moment, this is a paper form that is being generated, and you're putting in um, 
in the child's health folder, that is still required. Um, we're not quite happy with the health history information as it is in CSD CARES at the moment. So we still do need to have the regular form um, to be filled out and put in the child's record. However, most of the information can be captured here as well. So health histories are close to the bottom of the list of related boxes. Um, and here it's called health history parentheses enrollee. So you're going to hit new again, and it'll take you to a health history form. Now this is just, I didn't capture all of it. You, you notice the scroll bar here, you can go way down. This controls, this has actually almost the identical list of um, of statuses that is on the health history that, that you're doing on paper. And so it should be very familiar. And if you have a paper one, you should literally be able to just put the same information in this form and save it. Um, and it's not actually a health screening information that's missing from this. It's the status. <laughs> So based on what we were told in our FA2 review, we're going to want to update this health history screen so that it does ask you to make a determination. And then when you save that, you'll have a date associated with that. And that is something that then we can, we can track online and identify who's, who's made the determination within 90 days or whether they're in compliance. Um, since it doesn't have that language at the moment, it wouldn't pass muster anyway. So that's why we we need the offline form to continue to be in the child's folder. Okay. Um, but it is otherwise the same information. There we go. So those are the parts for you to input data. Um, and that module more or less does work. So when we're complaining about not everything being working in the system, you can put all the self information in there. The uh, sticking point right now is uh, reporting access and reporting um, capacity. So there are reports in here and depending on your specific uh, user profile, you may be able to see and access a number of them or maybe not as many as you need. So I, the only way we can fix that is, is kind of one by one. So I ask everyone who is responsible for putting in health records to go and try to run a report. And then if you can't, uh, to start a ticket in service now and include what the error message was. They just say you don't have permission to whatever it did so that we can work with you to upgrade everyone's access to what they need to have. Um, so if you didn't know there were reports in here at all, on the front page, the home page, you know, you click on the little house from anywhere within CSD Cares, you go back to the home page. Um, and one of the tiles on there has a magnifying glass on it and says reporting and analytics. So when you click on that, it'll give you a choice between reports and dashboards. Um, so you want to look at reports. So once you select reports, like most of Salesforce, it's going to default to the recently viewed view. And so I don't, I don't love that option because if you haven't looked at reports in the system prior to now, when you log in, you're going to see your recently viewed reports and there aren't any, so it will be blank. Here in the account that I'm using, for example, I only used it to call up one report, so there's only one report on the list. <laughs> that doesn't mean there's only one report in CSD Cares. It just it's just defaulting to um, that recently view. So there's two options that are more useful. Uh, one of them is all reports, and the other one is all folders. The folders view. I mean, obviously, it will take you to a list of folders. That's useful if you're looking for a specific kind of thing that's common. Um, so there's one, there's going to be a folder that says enrollment reports. There's going to be a folder that says attendance. 
Um, so if you're looking for those things, that's an easy way to do it. Um, I don't believe all of health is in one place. So what I would do for health reports is go to all reports and then search, use the search bar to search specifically for the kind of reports you're doing. Because it only the search bar is only going to search the screen that you're on. Um, so again, when you're on the recent screen, if there isn't anything there, there will be nothing in the search either. So you have to change your view. Okay. <laughs> So here's the first one. Um, it's, so some of these, they have numbers because an attempt was made to duplicate many of the reports um, that were in COPA and they included the same number. So they'd sound familiar to people who had used COPA. Um, so, and that was done frankly with varying degrees of success, but here we've got the 402 health greeting status report. Um, it's crazy for me. It hopefully is more useful because for you because you'll only see the sites that that you have access to. Um, but as you can see, and this keeps going on to the right. It's not limited to the the screen as you can see here. It's got all of the different types of screenings, how many of them um, were completed. So. Since ideally all of the kids would have all of the screenings, um, <laughs> you look at this and you see, okay, um, everyone's got their anemia screening here, everyone's got their body mass index screening here, uh, but boy, did we not get blood pressure. Um, that now this is, you notice among the health events, because they are in fact on the EPSDT, um, you will have the developmental and behavioral screenings in there as health events. However, and this is a little bit beyond the purview of today, which is the health screening, but when we get to um, education, there is actually also a separate related list for screenings, which is where we really need to have the uh, developmental and behavioral screening. But everything that's on the EPSDT has something that you can answer under health events. So, and then if you look at this, you can see that the list on top is by site. So it's got the head count, each site of who has received the various screenings. Um, but if you look down, there will be a details box at the bottom. And this has actually got um, all of the children. I've obviously removed their names here, um, but it's going to be sorted by screening type, but you can look down there and see which uh, which children have which screening. Um, you can get that list in more detail if you export this, which is something I'm going to talk to you about in just a minute. So another one that's useful is, again, the immunization tracking. Um, it doesn't have the bottom box with it, or actually it doesn't have the top box from the other report. This is going to be a list of uh, immunization types and then which children have them. I, there is an argument to be made that this would be more useful the other way around um, for a youth agency user, not necessarily at the at the city level. Um, But again, this is the 453. To work with something like this, as I just said, it's um, <clears throat> it's probably easier to export these reports as an Excel spreadsheet, and then you can work with them in that format. So up, I cut the screening off here, so I have the little box at the bottom. Up with the, normally in the top right corner of any report screen, there's a... Uh, box that says edit, which depending on your access may be grayed out. Um, but when you click on that triangle, you should still be given the option to export and then it'll ask how you want it exported. So you can uh, you can get a 
like a comma separated value file if you want it, if you can use it in some other kind of software. But it's probably easiest just to pick uh, the latest version of Excel off of that list and download it. And then you can see um, all the information in, in spreadsheet format, and you'll be able to resort it. So if you want it sorted by child rather than um, by immunization type, you can do that. Um, so there are obviously other reports that we need and try to build um, based on pre-existing COPA reports. Like I said, sometimes that works better, but other times the structure of the data in Salesforce has made that difficult, but we're working on that. So I do expect to follow up with you later in the program year uh, with more information about reporting. Um, it's definitely on the agenda. It's, it's, we have some other things that we need to work through first, and hopefully it won't take very long. Okay. So I might just keep adding to this every time we have an additional uh, webinar, but <laughs> what do we need you to be doing? Um, the children should be enrolled by now. I'm looking in the system and I'm seeing that they're not. Um, I would guess maybe half of children are completely enrolled in the classroom and have the correct funding model attached. Um, if that's not done, all the reporting capacity in the world won't help us because the reports will be blank. So that's why getting enrollment done continues to be the top priority here. Um, we want you to take attendance every day. We want their health records answered and we need a complete health history and everyone within 90 days of enrollment. In addition, I'm not mentioning it here because there's rent out of room on the screen, but if they're funded by PFA or PI, we need that ISBI history to be completed. Um, other things that you can be doing in the system are to explore the knowledge base. As I showed you before, watch the trainings that are available. And when you get your CSD updates twice a week, please read them. There's important information in there. And then again, if you're attempting to do these things and it is not working, start a ticket. Okay, so some of the key things in the knowledge base, um, the enrollment management section is there. Almost everything that I've covered today is within the family support case management section. Now, probably you're expecting health to be a different section. So am I, and maybe we can reorganize that in the future. But for now, um, it's just part of family support. There's a lot of good stuff in there and we'll come back. I don't know if it's the next one, but soon I'm going to discuss um, uh, family support and family uh, partnership issues in, in a future webinar. Okay. So again, in that ServiceNow app is both the ticket system if you need help and the knowledge base. So if things aren't working, that should be the first place you go to look. All right. We take a look at the chat. I am not seeing any questions, and that's probably because I should have started out by saying, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. And I don't believe I said that. <laughs> Apologies. If you do have a, additional questions, um please drop me a line um and you can do that by sending me an email or in fact you can go into service now and start a ticket and they will direct that to me pretty quickly okay Well, I'm not seeing any other questions here. 
Oh, I do. Uh, yes, here we go. Will you be able to send this PowerPoint? Yes, um, I will. I will send it out. It'll probably go out Monday. I would say I would send it out today, but as I mentioned before, I swear I had one more slide in here, and I don't know what happened to it. <laughs> it's the one that laid out the difference between the accounts and context. Uh, and told you what a related box is. So I'll see if I can dig that up and reinsert it. Otherwise, we will send this back out um, probably in Monday's update. Uh, okay. So anyway, I told you this will be short. I hope they will continue to be short because I don't want to post hour and a half long videos um it's better to break them into bite-sized chunks and people will find them more useful to refer to so instead of doing a big long one we're going to be doing several more roughly every two weeks into december so stay tuned and we'll be back soon thank you all for coming in for your time and for all the work that you do for uh the most vulnerable children in chicago <laughs>